Good afternoon. If you could all take your seats, please. Well, we want to welcome you all to the first uh, DATUM seminar um, hosted by the South Bay Salt Pond Restoration Project. I want to thank you for attending. And I understand that there is about 10 people on the webinar. Um, and this is being uh, br broadcast live as well as recorded. Um, and so in order for your questions to be heard, we'll need you to speak into a microphone that I had so that we can, the people on the webinar can hear your question and also for the future video that your question will be recorded. And Mar Marty will be taking questions at the end of each section. She'll prompt you to, as to when she would like questions. So please hold your questions until then. If you're on the webinar, you should have received an email address to send the question to. Um, so go ahead and send your question when you have it, and then I will hold the question until Marty takes questions at the end of each section. And then I will read your question to Marty. Um, I, let's see, we want to thank um, the Fish and Wildlife Service for paying for the two new uh, <laughs> gauges, one at the Dumbarton Bridge and a, a long-term one at the Coyote El Viso confluence. And we also want to thank Ann Sturm from the Corps of Engineers for all her hard work in getting those um, gauges in line and um, uh, processing the data. So, oh, I didn't introduce myself. I'm sorry. I'm Laura Velopi, the lead scientist for the South Bay Salt Pond Restoration Project. And I thought we would just do a quick introduction since um, it's a relatively small group. So, Marty? Yeah. Do you want to introduce yourself, Ann? Ann Sturm. I'm with the Corps of Engineers in San Francisco District, and I've been managing and helping with the contract that um, is using the Fish and Wildlife Funds to collect the water level data in the South Bay. I'm Amy Foxgrover with USGS in Santa Cruz. Uh, David Finlayson with the USGS. Um, I'm in charge of our C4 mapping program. Steve Sullivan of Sea Surveyor. Andrew Oltzko with Alameda County Flood Control District. Ralph Johnson with Alameda County Flood Control District. Justin Vandiver, uh, AECOM in Oakland. Gavin Archbald, formerly with San Francisco State University, just graduated. David Thompson, I do uh, wetland ecology work. Lisa Sheely at UC Berkeley. John Calloway at the University of San Francisco. Uh, Jeremy Lowe with ESA PWA. <coughs> Bob Vitalio, ESA PWA. Michael McWilliams, I do uh, 3D modeling of San Francisco Bay. Frank Hull, I'm a Cobb engineer. San Francisco District. Eric Maroos, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Jan Thompson, USGS Menlo Park. Joanne Gromberg, USGS. Noemi Alvarez, USGS. Okay, with that, can you hear me? With that, I'll introduce um, Marty Ikahara. She's the geodetic advisor for California. She's with NOAA National Geodetic Survey. And uh, I just wanted to note that Marty has agreed to take up any follow-up questions um, after this seminar via email, and she'll show her email address on the um, PowerPoint in the beginning. So I just wanted to give you a heads up on that. And with that, Marty, we'll turn it over to you. Actually. Actually, before Marty starts, I just, I know there's a lot of people that are very interested in the fish and wildlife, the data we're collecting in the South Bay from the two new tide gauges. Um, we had hoped to be able to give that data out and present it today. We're not quite there yet. Hopefully the data should be available to the public in about a week. Um, we actually won't have some new preliminary tidal datums um, for another month or so. Um, but we have gotten really good data at the Coyote Creek Alvisa Slough Gauge starting in March, and we've got data from the Dumbarton Gauge starting in February. Um, and there, it has some gaps, but really good data starting in March on through. But both those gauges, well, Dumbarton will be out for at least another month, um, and then the Coyote Gauge will stay out for the full 12 months. 
So. And again, if you um, signed up via Eventbrite, you'll receive an email with a link to the data once um, the court puts it up. And if you have not signed up via Eventbrite, please sign up on the sign up sheet. And if you're on the webinar and have not signed up via Eventbrite, just send me an email and I'll make sure you um, get the update. And it'll also be posted on the South Bay Salt Pond Restoration website. Good afternoon. Thank you for coming. Um, my email address is here, and I think this is the only slide that shows that, so I just want to make you aware of that. Um, we're going to uh, go through the geodetic vertical datum uh, component, and then after a break, follow up with the tidal datums in the second part. So I'm not going to read this, but this is the agenda. And I've changed it a little bit from what I had sent Laura. I, I warned her that I might be um, at revising as I go. But uh, I want to talk about the, uh, the ge geodetic datums in general, which include horizontal or geometric, and, uh, and then hone in on vertical datums. Talk a little bit about uh, GPS technology. It was very helpful, actually, the way Laura set it up to have questions um, that you had uh, about, and uh, so I could uh, focus on that. And one of the things was uh, questions about GPS and how it works and why might it not work, et cetera, et cetera. And then show you some examples of uh, geodetic uh, GPS data um, and the results we get from that. I think the point being that it's quite difficult to get vertical uh, elevations uh, with GPS. And then talk about geodetic control, focusing on the uh, vertical components. Um, I'll start off with showing you our resources. Uh, I work for National Geodetic Survey. I'm in Sacramento. And uh, I wanted to make you aware of what we have in terms of uh, previous presentations and webinars. Um, on our main page, one of the tabs is Science and Education. And under here, we have workshops and training link, uh, which have previous webinars and seminars available, both the PowerPoints and the entire audio presentation, uh, including questions and answers. We have a presentation archive, which is primarily uh, from conferences from everybody in NGS. And I plan to post this, these uh, on there as well. And we have online. Uh, learning resources. I'm sorry, that's actually really where you'll find the uh, webinars. If you want to sign up for workshops or training, then it would be the first link that I showed you. This is a sample of the online uh, resources. So I was thinking, you know, any one of these sections could is a two-hour webinar on its own. So what I'm trying to do is distill what I think are the salient points about each two-hour um, section to share with you and it it may get overwhelming at times but that's because I'm trying to distill it down to I think the essence but if you want to uh, learn more then you could uh, go to any one of these and you'll see in fact there's a geodetic and tidal vertical datums here and so that might be the one that uh, you'd be interested in uh, most of these so uh, I wanted to uh, start with <laughs> what I'm calling the world, according to Garpodesi. Why do we care about what the shape of the Earth is? And it's because nowadays we're measuring vertical data with GPS. And so GPS is a three-dimensional system. We have to understand the entire coordinate system that GPS operates under to work towards fine-tuning the vertical component of that. So we're studying the size and shape of the Earth. Our Earth is represented in terms of geodesy by an oblate ellipsoid with an A axis and a flattening parameter because it's not exactly a, a perfect ellipsoid. The ellipsoid utilized by many coordinate systems is GRS-80, Geodetic Reference System of 1980. And the World Geodetic System of 1984 is the ellipsoid used by the Department of Defense for GPS. And so we're translating GPS information um, into uh, datums that, that we utilize. Here's what we use in the U.S. 
and the datums that are associated with them. The original one that I want to go back to um, that you've heard of is NAD 27, North American Datum of 1927, and it was based on the Clark 1866 reference ellipsoid. Then along came NAD 83 datum, North American Datum 1983, which is based on the geodetic reference system of 1980 ellipsoid. And these are the equations that give you the A-axis and the flattening parameters. WGS 84 is very similar, same size in terms of the A-axis, but slightly different way out here um, in the flattening. And I think it's like a tenth of a millimeter or something for the, for the continent of the U.S. Not very much different, and that's why we say it's roughly equivalent, um, those geodetic systems, those ellipsoids. Those are the ellipsoids. Now, what really is a datum? It is a geographic system for coordinates or heights. So a datum has an origin and or a zero reference point. Underlying the geometric datum system is an ellipsoid, which I just showed you previously, that represents the global shape of the Earth. I think of it as a, as a geometric datum as the continental shape, as bringing that global reference down to the continent that you're working on, and that has physical marks that basically you can visit. Um, passive are what we call our traditional monuments, the disks in concrete, if you will, that, are, that were what was established uh, early on. Active monuments now are basically continuous GPS stations, and I'll go into more detail about that. They've been related by geodetic surveying. They define the datum. They bring it down to earth, so to speak. So originally, back in 1986, when we published NAD 83, it was thought to be geocentric, but it wasn't based on GPS data. It was based on traditional conventional surveying, line of sight. So at the time, uh, we defined the NAD 83 as best we could. It was not geocentric, as we found out later, with the addition of GPS data. Here's a representation, simplified, of the difference between NAD 83 versus an international terrestrial reference frame datum, coordinate system, or WGS84. They are the same shape. They're both based on, or all based on, GRS80, but the origins differ. NAD83 is not, in essence, geocentric. It is not ECEF, Earth-centered, Earth-fixed. So that uh, is the difference between uh, one, those uh, systems. <coughs> This, gra <coughs> excuse me. this graphic illustrates the difference. Um, you may have heard that they can be considered equivalent, NAD83, WGS84, or ITRF, uh, blank, blank, number, number. That may be true, not geodetically speaking, they're not equivalent, but it may well be considered equivalent for mapping purposes. Um, but vertically, they are not the same. So what I've done here, and this is a screen capture from our uh, VDATUM software, which I'll go into more detail in part two, actually. But this is just to illustrate that, in fact, if you put in WGS84 as the input vertical datum and uh, utilize NAD83 as your output, there's a difference of half a meter in those. So if you're collecting bathymetric data, for example, which would gen generally tend to be WGS84 system, then you need to do some conversions to get to another ellipsoid, such as NAD83. And you can, by the way, change this from heights to soundings. That's a pretty handy option. What is a reference frame? That was one of the questions I said I would try to answer on the, in the uh, agenda. It's a fundamental or the highest accuracy geodetic three-dimensional coordinate system that includes velocities. You know the Earth is a dynamic place. And these days, with the precision and accuracy of the equipment that we use, 
we see it too. We can't ignore it as we could certainly with uh, traditional uh, conventional geodetic equipment. A reference frame can also be a datum. ITRF is a global geodetic system based on data from continuous GNSS stations. GNSS is uh, the modern terminology for any uh, satellite-based navigation system. GPS is the Department of Defense's system. GNSS includes many others. Russia has one that's up. China has one that's going up. India has one, and so on and so forth. So that collectively is called GNSS. Our NAD83 datum at the national level is actually transformed from the ITRF system, which is de uh, defined by cores, continuously operating reference stations. That's the set or subset of GPS or GNSS, active stations that NGS uses to define the NSRS, the National Spatial Reference System. So the first transform using GPS data was in 1996. That's why if you utilize OPUS, which I'll go into in more detail later, solutions, you'll see the reference frame is NAD83 cores 96. OPUS stands for Online Positioning User Service. And it's uh, an online service that by, whereby you can uh, submit uh, GPS data to us and get solutions back. So I'm not going to go into detail here. Um, this is sort of a complicated slide because I think it is complicated. Um, you have our, our basis, the ITRF. There have been many versions since 1988. Um, there's actually uh, not shown because it's just recently adopted ITRF 2008. Um, but what we do is we start with an ITRF, excuse me, ITRF, and we transform into NAD 83. WGS 84 from 1994 was then equivalent to ITRF XX. As I said, I'm not going to go into detail. I am making um, the PowerPoints available, and in fact, I have a bunch of uh, notes that are associated with these. I'm sort of a uh, in veteran slide stealer. So, <laughs> so I've stolen a bunch of slides, and in fact, that's why I'm utilizing some notes here, because there may be things from other people's slides that I want to make sure to cover. But because I'm making the PowerPoint available, you'll be able to read them at your le leisure as well later on. Um, this, these two slides were uh, taken at a, or t from a paper given uh, in conjunction with the Canadian Geodetic Survey. And so that's what that stands for in this case is Canadian Spatial Reference System. Um, so there, uh, this, these uh, slides pertain to either system. But NED83, as I said, is a transformation from ITRF. It's 14 parameters. There's three parameters for translation, three for rotation, one for scale, and then the changes over time associated with each one of those. Um, it, it's, it is compatible with the original NAD83, which is 1986, but it does differ, again, I repeat that, from WGS84 by uh, this amount in terms of the center. So, how do we realize a datum? We collect observations at stations, passive stations, and process them together uh, and, uh, and define the datum by this collective uh, system of observations and adjustment. It's a least squares adjustment. So over the past uh, few decades, we've tended to do state by state uh, adjustments. In 2007, we did a national adjustment, and it results in new coordinates and ellipsoid heights and is identified by a datum tag. I bring this up primarily at this time to, to inform you that the orthometric heights are not revised. So uh, although the ellipsoid heights from, uh, that went into determining the orthometric height, and I'll visit that next, um, change, 
the orthometric heights are not readjusted at the same time. And so one of the things to note here is that therefore the, the ellipsoid heights are not comparable over uh, different adjustments and that's identified by the datum tag. Um, they've used different constraints, controls, uh, as the uh, fixed stations and they're not exactly comparable. I think I'll stop here and ask if there are any questions so far. Okay. I think I have a question, kind of basic, but why does it keep changing? I mean, is it, I mean, the Earth isn't changing, or, or is it? The Earth is changing. It is changing. Okay, so it's not that they're refining the techniques for getting the data. The Earth is changing, and that's the primary reason. Man, I didn't even plant you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, all right. <laughs> that was the perfect question oh, to okay. segue into this next thing. Right. The Earth is changing, and uh, we, we uh, express that by epic dates. So because the Earth is changing and because in fact, there are different stations that go into basically the realization of the datum. Um, you know, let's take, take a, just a basic ellipsoid. Let's say you have six points that you observed with GPS and you're saying this defines the datum. And then next year you take another six points and you define the datum that way. So your, your origin points or one of them gets knocked out or two of them get knocked out. So you have to add different points. It's a least squares adjustment that comes up with those coordinates that still best define the datum, but they're different points. So the numbers are going to change a little bit like any data, you know. So, but that's an excellent question. And so there are two types of epic dates that, in California, that uh, are pertinent, I think. One actually reflects the time of the field observations, and 2002.75 is an epic that's common to many stations in the South Bay, or was. Or it reflects the time of the recent national adjustment, 2007.00 which is our current epic date because we had a national adjustment. Or, and this is not true in any stations in this area, but it is in Sacramento Valley, it was a local adjustment constrained to the national. Or it could, could have been a statewide project that was a, an adjustment by California Spatial Reference Center, which is based at uh, UC San, Di San Diego uh, Scripps. So an epic date, um, it is important because our coordinates are changing so much. It's a crucial piece, crucial in fact, piece of metadata. Um, in fact, it's so crucial, I hesitate to call it metadata. It's really, in my mind, data. It's a critical part of the coordinates. You can't talk about coordinates in California without including the epic date. And in fact, for land surveyors, that is required. You must include the epic date whenever you have any coordinates. Uh, whether you give them or, or, or publish them. So um, the most recent uh, statement, uh, I'll show you just a screen capture. California Spatial Reference Center has just a couple weeks ago come up with a, a new epic date, 2011.00, for 830 continuous GPS sites in California and some few across the uh, state's uh, borders. And uh, there, for example, are the uh, ellipsoid heights, NED83, lat long, and ellipsoid heights. If you post-process uh, data, you might be interested in, in knowing that. Any questions? Yes. Isn't it important that we all use the same datum? The same datum? Yeah for comparability? Yes. So it seems like there's so many. I'm well, it's certainly important to define or to state what datum it is. Um, there are ways to transform among datums, but I think in terms of vertical datums, I think it's important to use NAVD88, which is the current vertical datum. Okay. 
I, I, sorry, I think I got confused because you said some weren't comparable. Mostly I was uh, talking about the ellipsoid heights, which I'll go into, but yes. They're not directly comparable. I mean, it's like it, if you had uh, a value in ellipsoid height that was determined by one project, and then the, um, the statewide, say, um, realization of that datum changed, and you come up with a new number, you can't say, and you subtract those two values, you can't say, okay, because there's a difference of, let's say, a decimeter, then that point changed exactly a decimeter. That's what I mean by they're not really comparable, because it was a different realization, different control that went into the adjustment that produced that value. But let me go on to a little bit about what we're trying to do. As I said at the beginning, vertical data these days is uh, obtained by GPS measurements. GPS only understands this smooth, mathematically defined ellipsoid, GRS-80, which then is the basis for WGS-84. We're trying to be up here, the topographic surface. This is the real world land. We need to get from this to this. All we know is little h, or ellipsoid height, from GPS. We need to figure out what the difference is between this value, which is your geoid, and this value. And the reason is because the heights, as shown on this representation, are reference to a vertical datum that was determined by leveling, which is referenced to this value, the geoid. All leveling is actually, that's why when you do leveling, you level up your instrument. There's a, if you will, internal plumb bob in your instrument that is dependent on gravity. So your, your vertical uh, measurements are really reference to the geoid, which is the geopotential um, uh, of, if you will, a global mean sea level. So we are struggling to determine accurately the geoid separation, the geoid height. We've come up with several geoids over the years. We are currently on geoid 09. And what, uh, how we determine that is by uh, taking GPS ellipsoid height measurements that have been made at the benchmark that was leveled and finding out what that difference is and modeling that. But I'm getting ahead of myself just a little bit. Let me talk a little bit here, maybe a better illustration of, of, the, uh, of what we're trying to do. The datum, the vertical datum, NAVD88, is defined by leveling. So here's your plumb line with, from your level at the surface reference to the geoid. The geoid happens to be the geopotential line and there are several of them that represents what would be a global or mean sea level. We are trying to determine what the orthometric height is reference to an ellipsoid that ne doesn't necessarily have anything to do with the geoid surface. And that's how we uh, try to come up with uh, what that geoid separation is. I mentioned that uh, geoid, or excuse me, uh, benchmarks are leveled, and you won't find very many benchmarks that actually have observed gravity. I look at a lot of data sheets. This is an NGS data sheet for geodetic control. I look at, as you might imagine, dozens and hundreds of data sheets. And in my 12 years in this job, I've not very found very many benchmarks that have gravity observation. Most of the time you see a modeled gravity value, but every leveled benchmark has a gravity value, whether it's modeled or observed. So we are um, doing our best to come up with the um, gravity model that is based on uh, observations, as I said, GPS observations at level benchmarks. 
We start with a global geoid model. This is from satellite data, contours shown in, in milligals. And from this, we t uh, develop a hybrid geoid model that is based on marks that have both GPS and leveled heights. This is a graphic I did for California comparing GEOID-09 values, which are the smaller overlying dots, with what went into GEOID-03, which are the larger underlying dots. We added a, a bunch of stations in Northern California through a, a large height modernization project there. But we went from about uh, 530 marks in a GEOID-03 to 800 something marks, so it was almost a 30% increase in the data that went into defining GEOID-09 um, in, in California. Any questions? Okay. What vertical datums are in use? Sort of a summary here. For orthometric, we have NEVD-88 and uh, NGVD-29. For ellipsoid datums, we have NED83. There are actually four uh, definitions of WGS84. There are 11 definitions of the ITRF reference frame. We have non-tidal datums in the International Great Lakes datum of 1985. We have tidal datums, and we have island datums that are specific to each island um, where we have responsibilities. So these are based on mean sea level, but each island has their own datum because mean sea level, if you will, is a local phenomenon. A couple of slides about NGVD-29 and, and NEVD-88. NGVD-29 was defined by referencing 26 tide gauges, 21 in the U.S. and, and 5 in Canada. And we assumed, incorrectly, but we assumed that, or we defined a single vertical datum by averaging uh, the mean sea levels at each of these, these tide gauges and adjusting the leveling data to uh, accommodate that. So it was originally called a sea level datum of 29. It, it, uh, we changed the name to NGBD29 to try to get away from the confusion um, that it was a mean sea level datum. Um, it was actually an average, and it did not, uh, it did not, it, the sea is not the same, but we uh, were able to average the data and uh, make it equivalent. And in those days, nobody was leveling all the way across the country but us. So it didn't matter to most people that there was this error that was actually incorporated into the definition of the, of the datum. So we changed that uh, when we defined the next datum, NEVD88. And instead of uh, averaging, we started at one point and uh, referenced it to mean sea level at this point, uh, which is actually at the mouth of the Great Lakes uh, St. Lawrence Seaway, and then leveled across the country and uh, from this point and defined the datum that way. So NEVD 88 differs from NGVD 29 because it's not an average of sea levels at multiple tide gauges. These are the differences uh, that are uh, apparent in the two datums. So you can see as we went westward across the country, uh, the differences got to be significant over a meter here in Oregon, 85 centimeters here in San Francisco. I think actually in some ways we have it easy because when I get uh, questions about, hmm, I have a problem and it's about uh, 0.8 meters, I can usually pinpoint that it's an issue with which vertical datum was utilized. Where it's closer, you might not be able to realize that it's a, it's a datum issue, if you will. Any questions before I get into the GPS technology part? There's one there. Hi, I just had a question about 
WGS 84, that there was four versions of it. I, I was a little late, so I might have missed, covered that. Yes. Already. Since since it was defined in the 80s, there have been four different realizations that Department of Defense has come up with. So which one? The current one is called G1150. Okay. And that was actually about 10 years ago. Okay. One of the questions uh, that came in on the uh, on the sign up was about GPS technology. And so I wanted to spend a little bit of time talking about why technology wise it's so difficult to get good heights. I apologize if you already know this, I'm not sure how much uh, is background uh, that you know or not, but GPS is basically a radio receiver. It does calculations to determine for each of the satellites in view the number of integers of the full phase cycles of the carrier phase part of the GPS code. GPS code has, uh, is embedded on the signal and, and comes uh, from the satellite to the receiver. The code is, and I don't know this factoid, but the code does not repeat for something like seven months. So you're basically trying to figure out what part of that code you are receiving at that moment. And that's the whole thing that the GPS receiver is doing, trying to figure out how many full wavelengths before that moment you are and where you are in the code. If that solution is correct, the calculated distance based on the range to the satellite is correct and your triangulation of where you are is likely to be correct. But it can be wrong. It can guess wrong. And that's when you will have an error in where you are. We were talking about this on, in the car, the difference between precision and accuracy. And I was supposed to remember to say something <laughs> about... So GPS says it's accurate, but it's right. I think... Uh, on your screen, if you're in the field, it says accuracy and it has some number, but it's really precision. It's your repeatability. It's not truly your accuracy. So, um, Laura, I want to make, make sure to, to make that point. Um, but here, let me go into some of the things why uh, that impact that signal. Your triangulation works best, I'm sure, as you all know when your knowns are well distributed and not clumped, when you've got good spatial um, distribution and you're trying to triangulate, you'll get a, a better solution than if you've got them all on one side, say, of your unknown. For vertical, you can't get signals from below. So when you're trying to triangulate, if you will, your height, you don't get any solutions or answers or data from below. So you're trying to figure out your vertical from one side, if you will, of where you are. It's a very weak signal. It's a very weak signal. And it's coming from 24,000 kilometers above you. There are many things that can go into interrupting and or corrupting that signal. You can have error from ground sources from the air, so to speak, and from equipment. And uh, I have a graphic that shows this. This is a, a, steam, a, a slide stealing um, opportunity. But let's talk about what's uh, possible for error briefly. You've got orbit errors. The orbits are computed. NGS is one of the computation centers. There are clock errors. They have uh, rubidium or cesium clocks but there's still some error associated with that. And again, it's how much time it took to get the signal from here to there on Earth. You've got a lot of noise or interference in the ionosphere that, that impacts it. And dual frequency helps to figure out what that um, attenuation of the signal is going on in the ionosphere. There's troposphere, there's storms, there's uh, fronts that move through that also impact the signal. There's trees. There's buildings, if, if it bounces off something, or your own vehicle, 
bounces off your vehicle and ends up on, on your antenna, that's changed the signal as well. There's jamming from other radio sources, microwave sources, uh, etc. And then there's just receiver noise in the equipment. It is an electronic piece of equipment. So there's a lot of things that go into impacting the signal. There are sunspots. We are, there is an 11 year cycle of sunspot solar activity. This is a, a graphic that was uh, produced through um, 2007. And you can see here in 2011, we're supposed to be somewhere in here. So this range is somewhere about 75 sunspots to about uh, 130 or so sunspots in this year. Fortunately, the data are better than that. This is through 2011. So we're actually below the prediction, only about 50 or so. And so we're actually in a, a good period um, for, for the uh, sunspot activity. But that actually impacts uh, the, the possibility of uh, interruptions to the GPS signal. There's a, I took this from Steve Sullivan's report <laughs> verbatim, if I could. During collection of soundings, an unknown microwave source, possibly radar, occasionally disrupted the differential corrections. They found that putting metal shielding on the north side eliminated the microwave disruptions, or you think you did anyway, so. <laughs> but there are always a, a possibility of jamming or other radio sources, cell phone towers interfering it. And I know from personal experience that you can have military uh, airborne or even military airport um, operations that, that uh, impact as well. So there's a lot of things that go into just getting the data, and that's partly why it's very difficult. Um, the type of antenna you have also matters, we found out. So different antennas process the signal differently, naturally, and that can impact um, how the antenna uh, sees the signal coming in. And so there are models that have been calibrated for each antenna. These are uh, applied for geodetic processing. RTK, RTK technology, real-time kinematic technology is generally limited to 10 to 20 kilometers between the two stations, a base and a rover, because ionosphere changes are significant enough that the solution could be incorrect. The horizontal calculations from that triangular, triangulation are generally pretty good, but the vertical is much harder to get. Again, you've got your three signals at risk, actually. Each GPS unit signal can, has a, or can be impacted, and the correction that goes out uh, between the base and the rover. So repeating what I said earlier, the precision could be good, but accuracy is not as likely. If you see, for example, a picture, a dartboard, um, might have all your darts clustered in triangle one, but you were really aiming for 20. Your precision was good, but your accuracy was off. If you might uh, have your dart scattered, your precision is not as good, but if they center around what you're aiming for, then your accuracy will calculate out to be better. So in any GPS, redundancy is key. And for vertical, we feel that it's crucial to get multiple measurements. And ideally, with a different constellation, because you're getting a different solution and you can average those out. <clears throat> so we do not use uh, RTK technology to try to compute geodetic heights. And uh, we have more stringent procedures and that's uh, part of what's shown here. Um, we have a program called Height Modernization, which is the development of heights um, utilizing GPS technology. We did a lot of research um, some number of years ago, uh, 15 years ago or so, and came up with various uh, uh, specifications or guidelines to follow. Dual frequency receivers, as I mentioned, and fixed height poles. One of the biggest problems we found was that there were blunders um, by field people measuring the height of the uh, antenna above the ground. Redundancy, redundancy, redundancy. Every baseline, not every station, 
every baseline between two stations is observed twice and always a different time of day which differs by at least three hours um, between the start times. So this assures, we feel, or tends to assure, accuracy and not just precision because it's an independent observation. The guidelines that we have published, say 30 minutes, we have found through experience that really 45 minutes is a minimum and 60 minutes is preferred and most people that I work with that are doing these types of observations are actually just scheduling 60 minutes. So the amount of time that goes into reconning stations, putting in stations, um, doing the planning, doing the traveling between stations, 30 extra minutes, if you will, is a small addition in the scheme of the entire project. The station spacing is limited to, limited more or less, to 10 kilometers and should average for the whole project, seven kilometers. The difference in the, um, the baseline uh, ellipsoid height difference between the first observation and the second should not exceed two centimeters or 25 millimeters. And for the uh, fiducial stations for this project, um, which are at 40 kilometer spacings, we do three sessions of five hours to get the really good lat long and ellipsoid height. So I want to share next some, some real world data from a project, but I want to stop and ask if there are any questions about the GPS technology. Hearing none. Okay. Oh, sorry. Just a quick question about uh, the static. Uh, are you working between two GPS stations um, when you do static? You put two, one on each side of you, of your unknown? The, these height mod projects have multiple stations, like tens of stations in a network. So you've surrounded your unknown with knowns? Yes. Yes, you have multiple unknowns and maybe 10% of them would be knowns. Does that answer your question? Yeah. And, and Marty, um, is this, are these criteria uh, published somewhere? Yes, we have uh, guidelines on our uh, site under publications, online publications. There are actually two. One is for ellipsoid heights and the other is for orthometric heights. Thanks. Okay, some real world data. This is in just observed um, in April. So this came from the uh, Delta Height Mod Project, which is a DWR, Department of Water Resources project. Um, and uh, as I said, was observed in April, it had about 135 stations. So some terminology, a baseline has an ellipsoid height difference between two stations. A comparison is made between the two at least observations made on different days at a different time of day and they should agree to within two centimeters. So this column showing the ellipsoid height differences. So this is the column that I'm focusing on or the contractor focused on. The worst case was two decimeters, 20 centimeters. Okay, this is an hour of data and the times are over here or more. And dual frequency equipment, all the right techniques taken and we came up with 20 centimeters here, 10 and a half, 8.4. Well, you notice that all of them are related to the station number PT44. So, we said, okay, why is it so bad? There must be a reason. This is the station in Google Earth. See these trees? Not a good GPS environment anymore. Um, perhaps when it was established originally it was, but it's not. So we decided to remove it from the station. And so on and so forth. So you'll see that there's a, some five centimeter results, not nearly as bad, almost reasonable. But we found that by removing one vector, 
say from each of these data sets we can get it down to something that meets or comes close to the standard. As I was mentioning, we were doing 25 millimeters, so these uh, uh, fit that uh, criteria. Um, and then, so the worst case, uh, or the start of it, uh, was down to about three centimeters. Um, I don't want to belabor the point, but I do want to make the point that even with the best equipment, professional licensed land surveyors working, um, trying to get heights, it's extremely difficult. And in this case, and in many cases, about 5% of the observations have to be reobserved. We don't use RTK to get vertical. So, um, I don't want to go into all the details, but when we got down to removing um, either stations or discarding bad baselines when we had more than two to do that with, the worst case uh, was three centimeters pretty good, didn't meet the criteria. So, um, any questions about that? Any more questions about RTK? I'm not sure I answered um, a specific question, but, all right. Um, I want to spend, I can't tell what time it is. Okay, it's actually about two. Um, I want to spend a little bit more time before we take a break, um, quickly just showing you how to get geodetic vertical control. Uh, Laura talked about the co-ops website, and I'll get into that in part two. I want to just show you some ways to find vertical uh, geodetic control from our website. And that is on a data and imagery tab. There's a, a data sheets option. These are your choices for retrieval. You can get ASCII text files or shape files if you choose to. Um, and I pulled up Santa Clara County, figuring it would be pertinent to this situation. Chose any vertical control. Got a table of stations I always resort by vertical source. Always. Because then that puts everything together. And this is actually the screen capture after I've done that. So all of the best quality data are up top. 88 adjusted, which means it was leveled, and then height mod observations, um, and then resets, and then 29s, if there are any, and there are many counties that have many, are down at the bottom. So it's an easy way to just select those stations that are any VD88 um, vertical control. And here's an example of what I was talking about. Here's 88 adjusted. Um, height mod stations with the little h and GPS ops and so on and so forth. I've also put together a website that allows you to see uh, where you are. Um, I have this website actually in the Caltrans Office of Land Surveys. That's where my office is and um, they've made some space available um, on their website to do that. I'll say this, that at the moment you can't there is no tab or button on this website, so if you get to the land surveys, then you have to type in slash geodetic to find this website. But I've got KMLs online and the uh, shapefiles available already by county, and you can also use Google Maps if you don't have access to Google Earth. We do have a software called DS World on NGS's website. It shows all the control, which is handy, um, but it doesn't symbolize VertCon differently. So you may have geodetic control there that doesn't have uh, any VD88 that has been done, say, in the last 20 years. It's VertCon uh, stations, and you can't tell. So that's the downside to that. But here's the website. Um, I did select only those non-VertCon, any VD88 stations. and. Uh, and uh, I think that's the benefit to using this, uh, this version. You would click on geodetic control. Um, and what I generally do is go down to the bottom of this page and look at the uh, counties, which I've organized by Caltrans districts. Pick Santa Clara, and this is what comes up. So the blue triangles happen to be leveled. NAVD88, these green hexagons are height mod stations, 
and there are a few surrounding the bay or the south bay in Santa Clara County. Um, I zoomed in to see what there are. There's one here on Moffett Field, uh, one here right at the intersection of 237 and 101. Um, mission, et cetera, et cetera. But we can go into, uh, you know, you can explore this on your own. I also um, retrieved Alameda County, and this is what came up uh, for this. So there's a few more points here as well. And so I clicked on one of those, and a box opens up, and there's a hot link to the data sheet. Um, so you can get uh, the traditional ASCII uh, file version of it. So this one is uh, at a former Tide Station 4519. And this is the data sheet that I retrieved by clicking on that hot link. So I said, protect this mark at all costs, or make sure you transfer the elevation. If you do restoration work and this mark is at risk, I would urge you to make sure that this mark not be destroyed, because this is the representation of NAVD 88 in that area. This is a, uh, another way to look at this data. Network accuracies tell you how well um, the, the uh, published coordinates, and in this case, ellipsoid height are. Um, and because this is a height modernization station, the network accuracy is very good. This is in centimeters. So we're saying that the ellipsoid height accuracy for this station is plus or minus one centimeter. So I talked about data and metadata. Again, a, an important part of a geodetic value is that you know what the error bars are for it. Okay, let's see. Um, I didn't know if it was necessarily pertinent to South Bay, but I did want to make you aware that there's a, another project that is not in our database that California Spatial Reference Center did along the central coast. If you happen to do work along there, you might want to uh, be aware that this uh, project um, published on their web pages um, does have uh, height modernization values as well. And the, um, another place to look that is increasing in uh, popularity is our OPUS database. I mentioned OPUS. This is software whereby you can submit your data to us online. And within minutes, if everything is working well, and it often is, usually is, you will get a solution back. If you've collected and choose to publish with us four hours of data, this is where it goes. So there is a way to collect dual frequency data, submit it to us, and have it be published and accessible by anybody on our website. And that would be, um, here's your submission options, which I'm not getting into any detail about that. If you want to see what's on there, click on Publish Solutions. So that's what I did. I searched for 941, which is the three-digit um, prefix for all the tide gauges in California and got this list. I think there's only a couple more after this already submitted to us. One thing to note is that uh, the, the nature of the format of the PID, the permanent identifier, if it's two letters and four numbers, it's a traditional mark and it already exists also in our traditional database. If it's four letters and two numbers, then it only exists in the OPUS database. Um, and so here's an example of where co-ops has a number of benchmarks that were not geodetically leveled. So not all of the benchmarks that uh, are associated with tie gauges have geodetic um, uh, elevations. I think that was about, okay. Any questions? I was wondering if you could put the um, screen back up that shows where that benchmark was in Alameda County. Just we, it looked like it was near Newark Slough, but I couldn't tell. This one? Or? Yeah. It's 
and Mountain View Quad. But yeah, that sounds about right. Newark, somewhere over in Newark. Well, actually, Newark's moving right by your. Right here? There's Newark. Yeah. So yeah. So Actually, that may be a good time. Here's the Dumbarton tie gauge, right, Ann? Yes. And because um, I don't didn't have anything that shows where they are, and somewhere behind here is the Alviso Coyote Creek. I may have a I don't have another slide. The other tie gauge is around here, Ann, maybe. Yeah, it's up just a little right bit. Right there. You're at A6, and it's at the confluence of Coyote Creek and Alvisa Slough. Somewhere. So it's a little bit to your right. Yeah, and yeah. then straight up, right about there. Yeah. Okay. All right. Are people getting tired? Do you need a mental break? <laughs> no, I'm not. Okay. But, I mean... Okay, I got about five to ten more minutes, maybe, before I, was, I before I planned to break. But okay, okay. Let's see, where was I? Okay. Um, next was that I wanted to explain a little bit about what you see on a on an NGS data sheet and how to interpret that or how to. Uh, read that, I, I guess, if you will. Um, I wanted to say a little bit about digit significance, especially for height modernization stations, because I have seen some um, examples of, I guess, misused or I, I, adding um, significant digits after this. Somewhere I saw that the elevation of this mark was 2.950 meters. NGS is not saying it is 2.950. <laughs> we are saying it is 2.95 meters. And what isn't shown is what the error bars are. Any height modernization um, station has error bars, if you will, or of plus or minus five centimeters. And you can arrive at that by reading the documents themselves that go into um, how you uh, perform height modernization stations, uh, excuse me, surveys. Similarly, it's not 9.70 or whatever calculation, which I think I got 9.68. Um, if I were to take the meters and uh, apply the 1200, um, divided by 3937, which is the official factor for converting to U.S. survey foot, which is what California uses, it is 9.7 feet. So do not attribute an accuracy greater than we are saying if you're going to utilize our data. Um, and, and so I just want to, I don't want to belabor that point. Um, but I think it is important to realize that, you know, we have, we publish it to a certain degree of significance for a reason and to not um, uh, make it uh, greater than what it is, the accuracy greater than what it is. If you're trying to utilize um, data for, say, local purposes and just do relative elevations on your project, um, you would want to... Um, and your leveling say you would want to certainly do that to millimeters if you can, but uh, do not add on digits of significance when there were none to begin with. Um, okay. So this is a caution I wanted you to be aware of, and it may not happen very often, but it's an example of how to be wary of what you see or be very scrutinized what you see. So this elevation is shown to centimeters. It's 2.87 centimeters. But you'll note there's no note at the top that says this is a height modernization station, as it does here. Please read the metadata. We write these things for a good reason. And so this paragraph happens to be the one that I'm talking about, and this is what it says. 
GPS-derived arithmetic heights for airport stations, which is what this is, secondary airport control station, or primary, are published to decimal places. This maintains centimeter relative accuracy between them. It does not indicate centimeter accuracy basically relative to NAV88. So you have to read the data, you have to read the metadata to make sure you know what you're looking at and, and uh, talking about. So just an example of to look at your sources of data very carefully. Okay. Um, we talked about um, epic dates, um, but I think I will skip this and go on to the conclusion of this section. Um, this station was, is that Dumbarton Bridge Station, 4509 title. It had, I will show that, it had, it has uh, a benchmark uh, sheet, uh, excuse me, a, a traditional database sheet. People have gone to it subsequently and um, taken GPS observations and submitted them to us. Um, this one was observed in 2002.75. So that's the uh, error, if you will, of this, uh, this observation. Subsequently, in 2007, August 16, 2007, um, a person went to this station and observed it, came up with an ellipsoid height uh, and an orthometric height, and it utilized geoid 03. In conjunction with the establishment of this new tide gauge at Dumbarton, an observation was made on January 19th, 2011, and submitted to us. We got um, ellipsoid heights and orthometric heights utilizing G809. So I have up here these uh, numbers, but it got even confusing to me when I was reviewing this. So I decided to um, make a uh, summary table just showing the differences in how these different values were computed. And it may still be confusing, but um, we can study this at our leisure later. So from the published data sheet from this epoch, we get this value, 2.95 meters. And as I mentioned earlier, the error bars are plus or minus 5 centimeters. From the first Opus DB solution, the calculation was 2.855 plus or minus 10.8 centimeters. And that's this much error because of the error associated with geoid 03. From the most recent observation, 2.917 plus or minus 5 centimeters. So if you think about and look at these numbers, they all, if you will, fall within each other's error bars. I don't know a better way to say that, but uh, I think that's uh, important to realize that with the current geoid uh, value of geoid 09 um, and four hours of data, you can get some decent results that are, uh, have low enough error to reflect what we call the truth. This is the published value from a height mod survey from a least squares adjustment. So we feel this is, for purposes of this exercise, the truth of what the height of this mark is. So I just wanted to point out that there are um, different ways to arrive at, at the uh, elevations and we are um, trying to improve the geoid model sufficiently so that ultimately you can arrive at a reasonable, accurate orthometric height by using some number hours of GPS data and the geoid model to come up with a valid orthometric height. Um, but it does take a, a lot of work and, uh, and it's all about getting that geoid model to reflect what the differences are between the ellipsoid height and the vertical datum in AVD88. So um, I think I'm going to skip a few slides 
and just summarize what we've talked about and then take a break. Started off with the geodesy explaining how we represent the Earth and how we define the reference frame and the datums. Talked about why it's so difficult to get heights in particular with GPS technology. Showed you some real world data with uh, errors that ranged as, uh, as much as 20 centimeters. Um, and uh, how to find geodetic vertical control on our web pages. And then some of the things to look at when you're looking at our data sources. Any questions before we take a break? So far, so far I, I heard that, okay, the changes are due to the GPS, you know, error in, in measuring vertical uh, distances. But then I heard you say also you were going to talk about the changes of the Earth itself. And I was, uh, I was hoping that you will address that. How, how is it changing? How is the Earth changing? What, what do you mean by that? Can you expound on, on your comment that you made? 20 minutes ago or so. Right. So, well, uh, when I answered that question, I mean, I was thinking originally horizontal because in California we have to be very concerned about the horizontal crustal motion. But of course there is vertical crustal motion as well. And one of the ways that we're looking to be able to, to um, ascertain how that might be changing is to utilize OPUS and come up with if you will, a current ellipsoid height and orthometric height. Um, because we're, we, NGS, are not going to go out and redo uh, measurements. That's beyond what we're capable of doing. Um, but one of the uh, ways to do that is to get high quality GPS data and see what the solutions uh, are. Um, but I think you know, there are, there's a certain amount of error that, you, that goes into the measurement I was just talking about. So let's say you actually have um, a large amount of land subside beyond the errors. You could ascertain that by collecting the new data. But if you have small amounts of vertical crustal motion, they'll be lost in the noise associated with the, the technology, both the equipment technology and the modeling that has to be applied to come up with the values. Does that answer your question? Okay. Any other questions? Bob. Um, do you have any um, published estimates of vertical land motion uh, around San Francisco Bay based on <coughs> these types of relevelings and, and the like? No, we haven't re-leveled, so certainly not based on re-leveling. Um, and we have not seen, there, there, we, did, we did any VD88 leveling once on the east side of, of the bay um, and then along the coast, Highway 1, but nothing really along the bay itself. Um, and then we did the height modernization survey um, South San Francisco area. But we didn't see any subsidence that exceeded the error bound bars for each of those different types of methods. Thank you. Well, we didn't have a lot of common points. You know, we're talking a handful of, of data points that were, that were involved in, that, in the height mod survey in 2002. Okay, let's take a break and uh, focus on tidal datums after that. Five so minutes? Tomorrow, excuse me, we'll take about a five minute break. The bathrooms are out this door and to the right at the top of the stairs. <laughs> 